Thank you. Um, thank you again for um, the, the invitation to come and, and speak today. It's a pleasure to, to be down here and um, talk to all of you. Um, so I, uh, the title of my um, talk today is on maternal and child nutrition effects on health and development throughout the life course. And as um, Dr. Brown illustrated so um, eloquently, the, the, the pregnancy and early um, childhood period can have um, profound effects on um, health and development of, of the individual. And he foc focused predominantly on the acute effects in terms of risk of, of mortality, um, severe infection, um, and child growth and development. Um, and so what I'm going to do with my presentation is, is talk um, also about how that period of life can have profound effects on the, the health of the individual um, beyond the, the childhood um, and infancy period and talk about some of the effects on um, adult risk of disease decades later. Um, I'll focus a little bit on um, long-term effects of undernutrition during pregnancy, and then also talk about some of the emerging areas of research into um, the effects of obesity and um, diabetes during pregnancy on um, health and development of the, of the offspring. So, um, okay. So the, the outline for my talk today is to start off by just um, very briefly talking about the nutrition and epidemiologic transition. And I have the good fortune of following Dr. Brown who presented that very nicely at the beginning of his talk. So I'll, I'll talk mainly about the United States, um, but then also talk about how we think about disease risk and how we think about disease causality, um, particularly with a focus on chronic disease risk. And why nutrition in pregnancy is important and why um, malnutrition, malnutrition being both undernutrition and overnutrition um, is, is important in terms of fetal development um, and the development of organs, organ systems, um, metabolic functioning that can have a lifelong um, impact. Uh, with that, talking about the link between maternal nutrition and chronic disease risk and then taking an example um, of obesity and diabetes during pregnancy. So we just heard about how important nutritional deficiencies are during pregnancy and early childhood um, in, in terms of their associated risks with um, morbidity, meaning increased risk of infection particularly, mortality, poor growth, poor cognitive development. But overweight and obesity and associated comorbidities are really growing in providence, prominence in much of the world. Um, but the consequences of obesity during pregnancy um, have only recently begun to have been studied. Now, how many of you have seen these, the CDC maps of obesity in the United States? Most of you have probably seen them. Um, it's, it's quite dramatic when you look at the, the rapidly growing prevalence of obesity um, in the United States over the past 20 to 30 years. In 1985, the highest, the, the states with the highest rate had about 10 to 14 percent risk of obesity. And over time, the CDC has in fact had to add more and more higher and higher categories to, to characterize um, the, the increasing
adapted to, um, to try to maximize the nutrient availability to the fetus. The fetus has um, received its entire nutrient supply across the placenta from the mother via either active transport or facilitated diffusion. And there are numerous mechanisms to maximize delivery to the fetus and the infant. And there are also mechanisms um, whereby the mother will deposit new tissues or deposition of um, maternal fat stores in order to serve um, the higher nutrient demands of late pregnancy and to support the, the nutrient requirements for lactation. There's also redistribution of nutrients among tissues, um, increased turnover rate or, or um, increased metabolic rate, and an increase in efficiency of nutrient absorption. And these mechanisms um, serve to increase the, the circulating nutrient supply that's available um, then to cross the placenta into the fetal um, compartment um, and also to, um, to meet the, the maternal needs. Um, also during pregnancy, um, fasting and postprandial glucose levels will increase. This is to deliver glucose to the fetus. Glucose is the, um, the primary source of um, energy for, the, for fetal development. It's critical for fetal development. Um, and in order to, to um, ensure that there is adequate glucose that can be delivered to the fetus, a state of insulin resistance to, develops um, and peaks in the third trimester of pregnancy um, to support glucose delivery to the fetus. And this is a normal part of pregnancy. But in individuals who already have um, some degree of insulin resistance, um, this can um, exacerbate their underlying state of insulin resistance, leading to a state of gestational diabetes and impro improper um, glucose metabolism within the mother. So glucose is, an, is a nutrient that um, the fetus needs for growth and development, but excess exposure to glucose can have um, severe effects in terms of birth defects and, um, and uh, in terms of um, fat and um, growth of the, of the fetus. There are also a number of physiologic changes during pregnancy that um, uh, physiologic adaptations for pregn during pregnancy. Um, there are mechanisms within the gut to, um, that are designed to improve nutrient absorption um, from the food that the mother eats. So she may not necessarily need to, um, she may not necessarily eat more um, food, but in fact the efficiency of intestinal absorption of some nutrients um, can improve during pregnancy as compared to a, a pre-pregnancy or a non-pregnant state. There's also changes in cardiovascular function increased cardiac output, an expansion of blood volume, um, an increase in plasma volume, and an increase in the total number of blood cells. Um, this is to improve um, oxygen delivery to the, um, to the fetus during development. So nutrient requirements do increase with pregnancy um, in order to meet both the maternal and the fetal demands, but it's not proportionally. There's some maternal behaviors behavioral changes um, that augment the physiologic changes that are occurring during pregnancy, but there, are a limit, there exists a limit to the physiologic capacity of the woman to adjust her own metabolism. When that limit is exceeded, fetal growth and development are impaired. And so there are long-term consequences both to under and overnutrition during pregnancy. And um, a field of research has developed um, referred to as the developmental origins of health and disease. And the basic premise is that early life nutritional and environmental factors may impact later life disease risk. The early research in this field focused predominantly on um, how fetal growth restriction, as indicated by lower birth weight, is associated with adult chronic disease risk. And this is, was referred to as um, the Barker hypothesis. Um, named for David Barker, who was one of the um, uh, first, or uh, yeah, one of the first proponents of the theory, and what he looked at, um, he noticed a correlation between um, patterns of infant mortality rate. And this is a, a map of England and Wales 
in the early part of the 20th century, he saw a correlation between areas with a high prevalence of infant or a high infant mortality rate um, in the early part of the century um, correlated strongly with areas that had a high coronary heart disease um, mortality um, rate in the latter part of the century. So what this suggested is that some factor related to um, poor um, neonatal and infant health was also associated with um, chronic disease risk. And he looked, he focused pr primarily on um, undernutrition because um, even though there are a variety of causes for um, low birth weight, um, smoking or lower socioeconomic status is often um, correlated with low birth weight. We do know that um, at least half of the, the risk of low birth, low birth weight can be attributed to um, maternal undernutrition, either lower BMI going into pregnancy or um, low weight gain during pregnancy. So what he saw when he looked at the, the association between birth weight and, um, in this case, type 2 diabetes risk, is that as birth weight increased, the risk of diabetes decreased. And it's almost a linear trend. So um, with every um, incremental change, improvement in birth weight, the risk of disease decades later was less. He saw a similar pattern for metabolic syndrome. Um, so as birth weight increased, the risk of metabolic syndrome also went down. Um, but as I said, there's a, lot of, there's a number of correlates um, or a lot of causes of low birth weight that may not specifically be due to um, undernutrition per se. So, but, but there, um, since that time have been a number of studies that have looked at um, individuals who have survived famine, um, either when their mothers were pregnant or when they were young infants, in order to, to use what we call a natural experiment of undernutrition, um, we can look at how a, a brief and severe period of undernutrition um, has an effect on um, health and development. The Dutch famine is one of the most um, well-studied um, famine. This is because there's um, quite good records of when um, individuals were born in relation to the famine. and. Um, very good health records for um, a number of health and uh, disease and cause of death outcomes um, in later life. The Dutch famine, or the, the so-called Dutch hunger winter of 1944, um, occurred during a brief period of time between late 1944 and May 1945. This was during World War II. It was caused due to a German blockade of the um, northern and western regions of the Netherlands. During that time, food supplies were blocked off, and it corresponded to a particularly severe and harsh winter where the canals froze, and the canals were the, the primary um, supply routes into the region. So um, when, uh, you know, around this time, you know, spring um, caused the canals to thaw, the supply routes opened up, the blockade was lifted, um, and so the famine ended around um, 1945. But during the, the, the most severe parts of the famine, the food rations in the region dropped to about 500 calories per day, and 18,000 people died due to starvation during that famine. Um, but after the, the um, supply routes opened up, food rations went back up to their pre-famine, their um, pre-blockade levels fairly quickly. So what we what researchers have done is looked at um, individuals whose mothers were pregnant during this period of time to look at how severe food restriction um, during various periods of pregnancy, um, uh, early in pregnancy, mid to late pregnancy, or infancy, um, affected those um, babies that were born during the famine or shortly after the famine on a wide variety of outcomes. And if you, if you put the Dutch famine into PubMed or other search engines, you'll find hundreds of articles that have been published on this, this group of people. I'm not going to focus on everything that's been studied, but um, rather just look at um, some of the chronic disease uh, outcomes that um, have been published on the survivors um, 50 years later. Those whose um, mothers 
were pregnant when they were um, early in pregnancy, and therefore they, as fetuses, were exposed early in gestation, um, had, as, as adults, higher BMI and higher waist circumference, particularly among women, um, a more adverse lipid profile, uh, a higher ratio of LDL cholesterol to HDL cholesterol, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, though um, some of those findings have been a, a bit mixed, um, and some um, evidence of cognitive um, impairments, lower selective attention span in adulthood. Those exposed during mid or late gestation tended to be born small and stayed small throughout their lives. Uh, they had reduced glucose tolerance, increased risk of microalbuminuria, and this is an indicator of kidney dysfunction, increased risk of obstructive airways disease. This is an indicator of um, impaired lung function. And this has led a number of um, investigators to propose the so-called thrifty phenotype hypothesis, that individuals who are born um, small due to um, undernutrition or other um, factors related to an adverse fetal environment um, are born lower birth weight and they, in, in a sense, adapt to this poorer environment by changing um, aspects of their growth, metabolism, and vasculature. They, um, pancreatic development is altered. There's a reduced pancreatic beta cell mass, which um, can cause um, problems in terms of beta cell function and insulin signaling and glucose metabolism in later life. There's an altered ratio of muscle and adipose tissue. Um, uh, they have a um, lower lean body mass at birth and a higher adipose tissue mass in terms of percent body weight at birth. There's alterations in um, neuroendocrine function. Um, it, it's been well described, at least in animal models, that um, undernutrition during pregnancy can cause changes in the way um, the, the individual responds to hunger and satiety cues. And that these that these animals are um, have a greater predisposition to overconsumption and overeating um, in childhood and adulthood. There's also changes to kidney function and kidney development. Um, there's a reduction in um, the number of nephrons within the kidney, which can reduce the glomerular filtration rate. That can lead to um, over time to renal disease and hypertension. And this clustering of risk factors. Um, of insulin resistance, hypertension, obesity, um, is what is referred to as the metabolic syndrome. And some have proposed that this may have, there may be intergenerational effects. <clears throat> now, another, let's see, um, I'm just going to go through this briefly, but um, epigenetics is a field that has arisen um, also that, that a number of investigators have looked at in, in terms of one of the, the metabolic mechanisms or the, the pathways through which um, exposures during the, the fetal environment um, or the fetal development um, may alter um, gene expression in the individual without changing underlying change, uh, aspects of um, DNA sequence. The field um, was um, first developed, or the term was first proposed um, by E. H. Waddington in 1942 as a way to describe um, that between genotype and phenotype, there, there is a whole complex of developmental processes that help to explain um, how individuals um, become the, the, the individuals that they are. Um, we aren't simply a product of our genes, but there's an interaction between genes and the environment on um, on who we are and what we become. Um, a particular area of epigenetics that is of interest to nutritionists is um, understanding um, gene expression in terms of DNA methylation and histone modification um, and non-coding RNAs. And particularly DNA methylation and histone modification are sensitive <laughs> to um, nutrients that can serve as methyl donors or that um, are involved in one carbon metabolism. Um, nutrients such as folate, B12, choline, choline methionine, um, will uh, in a way um, 
regulate which genes are expressed um, or which genes are um, turned off or, um, yeah. So, um, and, and it's been shown um, quite elegantly in animal models that um, low intake of um, these methyl donor nutrients can, um, can affect the way uh, um, parts of the, the DNA um, structure or parts of the DNA are expressed, particularly relating to um, insulin signaling and insulin metabolism. So um, in terms of the, the evidence for the developmental origins of disease, um, there's quite good data showing that global nutrient restriction, restriction in methyl donor nutrients and some minerals has an adverse effect on cardiovascular development, renal development, insulin signaling, and body composition. And that these effects are exacerbated when exposed to a high fat or Western diet postnatally. In terms of human evidence, though, um, it's been um, a bit more mixed. Uh, the long duration of time needed to follow up individuals um, can lead to selection bias. Um, it's in, investigators don't want to wait around 50 or 60 years in order to get their, their data and their results. Um, and using sort of convenience cohorts or, or cohorts such as the Dutch famine study um, where individuals were known to be exposed in early life have problems in terms of um, follow-up rates. There's a lot of people that were lost or that who disappeared for a variety of reasons who moved out of the area. Um, there can be also problems in, with um, survivor bias. And in, um, there may be um, other causes of death um, earlier in life that, um, you know, in a sense may bias the sample or may bias um, who you happen to catch when you um, go to do your study. There can be confounding by other factors, socioeconomic status, other environmental exposures. And it's difficult to disentangle um, effects in the prenatal versus the postnatal environment. Um, it's also very difficult to really effectively determine um, the mechanisms and the metabolic pathways when the insult may have occurred decades prior. So um, it's. It's, it's a challenge um, with uh, studying these um, long-term effects over, over the life course. Um, but we have um, other examples where you, we can see markers of um, metabolic risk, even early in childhood. Um, and so I want to talk about, in the last few minutes that I have, um, the, the consequences of overweight and obesity and complications due to diabetes during pregnancy. So the Institute of Medicine has released uh, weight gain recommendations for women during pregnancy. Um, and these weight gain recommendations vary depending on the maternal pre-pregnancy BMI. Women who have low BMI going into pregnancy are recommended to gain more weight than women who have, um, who have, higher, have normal weight or higher weight um, when they go into pregnancy. Um, but you'll notice that even uh, um, obese individuals um, are encouraged to, um, to gain weight during pregnancy. And some of these recommendations have come out of the, rec the recognition that um, postpartum weight retention is, um, is very important um, in terms of predicting obesity risk for adult women. Um, the weight gain recommendations have also been based on um, reducing the risk of low birth weight um, and uh, improving fetal growth. Um, but when we look at um, how close uh, pe women actually are to achieving these weight gain recommendations, it's, it's clear that it's, it's quite different. Um, it's a quite different picture than what we would hope um, is going on. So among underweight women, um, you can see in the sort of darker purple box, this is the weight gain recommendations as proposed by the Institute of Medicine. In the light purple box, these are the weight gain recommendations, or sorry, these are the weight gain patterns that um, are actually occurring in the US population. So among underweight women, it's not that far off, although underweight women tend to gain a little less than what is recommended. 
Um, normal weight women, um, it's, it's about right, maybe a tiny bit more than what's recommended. Um, but overweight and obese women are gaining substantially more than what is um, recommended during pregnancy. So um, this has implications both for the woman's health um, postpartum as well as um, potentially for fetal growth and development. Now when we look at the prevalence of childhood overweight and obesity by maternal pre-pregnancy BMI, um, you can see that the risk of obesity in childhood goes up with increasing maternal pre-pregnancy BMI. So women who have a higher BMI, um, those who are overweight or obese, um, their, their children have a greater risk of obesity. Um, this is in seven-year-olds. Um, but also, they've stratified this on those who um, met the recommended weight gain recommendations, those who were insufficient, and those who um, had excess weight gain during pregnancy. Um, and you can see, um, especially in the lower weights, the lower um, BMIs, those who gained weight excessively actually had a fairly high risk of obesity um, their children had a higher risk of obesity, which is um, quite interesting. So there, there's this interaction between low pre-pregnancy BMI in combination with very high weight gain during pregnancy that may um, lead to an increased risk of obesity in the, the children. Um, now, you might say, well, is this really due to um, the pregnancy environment per se, or is it due to the fact that children that are born into households that um, have certain dietary patterns may be predisposed, may be exposed to um, diet, you know, a, a diet that is more obesogenic. So is it really the pregnancy or is it the environment? Um, and actually I'll get, to, I have another slide for that in a second. Um, but I also wanted to talk about um, diabetes during pregnancy because it is related to um, obesity in pregnancy. So infants of diabetic mothers are at significantly greater risk of spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, congenital malformations, morbidity, and mortality. And 30 to 40 years ago, the prognosis for infants of diabetic mothers was not very good. Um, but um, in, there's been a lot of progress in terms of um, being able to <coughs> regulate um, maternal glucose during pregnancy and in terms of um, support for neonates that are born to diabetic mothers. So the prognosis has improved um, substantially over the past um, 20 to 30 years. But um, there has been an increase in the number of babies that are born to women who have um, diabetes during pregnancy, either pre-existing diabetes type 1 or type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes. Um, it's been estimated that 3 to 10 percent of pregnancies in the United States are affected by um, abnormal glycemic control. 80 percent of these are gestational diabetes. And actually this might be um, a little bit of an underestimate um, because these data were from um, about five years ago, so it might have gone up by now. Um, and then gestational diabetes is strongly associated with uh, maternal obesity. Overweight and obese women have two to three fold greater risk of gestational diabetes than normal weight women. And women who are morbidly obese have an eight fold, almost nine fold greater risk of gestational diabetes. During pregnancy, the fetus is exposed to hyperglycemia, meaning too much glucose, resulting in increased fetal insulin levels. And that and insulin serves as a growth promoter. Um, and it also serves to stimulate a greater um, deposition of excess energy as fat. So um, infants who are born to um, diabetic mothers um, may be uh, macrosomic, meaning large for their age or large for the gestational age, or a birth weight greater than the 95th percentile. But they're not just proportionately large, larger. They have a, a much higher um, percent body fat than um, infants who are born to non-diabetic mothers. That increase um, in glucose, that hyperglycemic state, also increases the fetal metabolic rate and demand for oxygen. So um, we can also look at um, the 
body mass index of children who are born to um, diabetic mothers. Um, and this is a study that looked at siblings who um, were born you know, to the same mother, but who, whether she was diabetic during that pregnancy or, um, or non-diabetic. So this may be women who experienced gestational diabetes during one of their pregnancies, but not another. Or it may have been women that had one pregnancy and then later went on to develop type 2 diabetes um, and had a second pregnancy during when they um, uh, had you know, uh, type 2 diabetes. So <clears throat> what these data showed was that um, individuals who were exposed to diabetes in utero had a higher body mass index um, throughout childhood and young adulthood compared to their siblings who were not exposed to diabetes when their mother was pregnant. Um, so this sort of speaks to the question of whether or not it is um, the prenatal environment or whether it's the household or family environment. Um, it's probably an aspect of both. That the, if there's a, a prenatal environment in which the mother is um, diabetic or obese, um, it, it sets the, the child off on a trajectory where they may be at greater risk for obesity in childhood. Um, and then these were data from a fairly small study, but this has been um, also demonstrated in much larger studies. Um, this was in a large population study with um, 10 to 20,000 individuals. Um, and you could see that uh, children who were born to diabetic mothers had an increased risk of um, overweight at the age of three, four, and seven compared to those who were unexposed to um, diabetes. And not only are they at greater risk of um, overweight, they're also at greater risk of developing um, type 2 diabetes themselves. Um, these are in um, children who, um, these are in, uh, Pima Indian children um, whose mothers either were non-diabetic, pre-diabetic, uh, meaning they, the mothers eventually went on to develop diabetes but were not diabetic during the pregnancy, or those who were diabetic during the pregnancy. Uh, in terms of glucose intolerance, you can see that the ones who were exposed to diabetes in utero had um, poor glucose regulation at every age in childhood. And quite a, a large and substantial difference when they were young adults. And going along with that, the prevalence of diabetes in children whose mothers were diabetic during the pregnancy um, is also dramatically higher compared to those whose mothers were pre-diabetic or, um, or not diabetic during their pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> So um, one of the hypotheses about this is that um, fetal hyperinsulinemia, meaning a high, um, high levels of insulin, um, in response to maternal um, hyperglycemia is a strong predictor of impaired glucose tolerance in later life. Um, some of this may be through um, regulations in um, the appetite um, pathways, the appetite metabolic pathways. Let's see, I'm going to skip over that. Um, Diabetes during pregnancy also has an effect on um, micronutrient metabolism, um, particularly iron metabolism. Um, there's an increase in the, the red blood cell mass um, in the fetal compartment um, in a response to the increased need for oxygen. So because uh, hyperglycemia during pregnancy can result in this um, rapid growth rate, there's an increased need for oxygen to keep up with that rapid growth rate. So to respond, the fetus increases their red blood cell production by up to 30%. Um, and to do that, the fetus needs more iron in order to um, produce all of that um, additional red blood cells and all of the additional hemoglobin that's needed. The placenta upregulates iron transport to try to meet that iron need, but it can't fully compensate for the higher requirements. And this can result in the fetus drawing down liver iron stores, um, and it, not just in the liver, but also in other um, critical tissues. 55% reduction in heart iron, 40% reduction in brain iron have been noted. And this is, this is the one I want to focus on for just a second. 
so um, we're not just concerned about obesity and, and overweight in, the, in children or the risk of um, diabetes, but also in, in other ways. Um, diabetes during pregnancy um, may contribute to cognitive impairments um, or poor cognitive development in children who are born to um, diabetic mothers. They tend to have reduced performance on tests of general development in infancy and toddlerhood, reduction in performance on learning and memory tasks in early childhood, reduced school performance and educational attainment, reduced IQ, and some of this may be due to that um, altered iron metabolism and lower iron um, that's being directed towards brain development um, during that critical window of um, infant development. The impairments are generally mild to moderate, um, and so it's been suggested that there may be ways to compensate um, by uh, targeting these children with, um, with interventions to help build and improve on um, language, motor, and um, memory function and me memory development. So just to conclude, nutrition during fetal development can have a lifelong impact on the health and disease risk. And um, understanding the consequences of these nutritional deficiencies or excesses in pregnancy, I think, requires a life course perspective. Um, and an understanding of the physiology of pregnancy and biologic critical windows of exposure. And it's a really um, fascinating and interesting field and it's really hard to try to pack it into one lecture. And so um, I encourage you, those of you that are interested to, um, if you really want to think about um, interventions or mechanisms that we can um, really have an impact on on the individual's life course trajectory to think about studying and um, working with pregnant women and young children because it can really have a, a large impact. So with that, I will finish. So thank you.